Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Genetics of the Chinchilla Persian webinar. My name is John Robinson, and I will be your host this afternoon. Now, just a little bit of background about me. I currently serve as a mentor and coach to small businesses, entrepreneurs, and authors around the world. Originally, I was trained as a wildlife biologist and supervised an endangered species program for the federal government for over 20 years. I've published 12 books, some of which have become number one bestsellers, and most people know me today as having an intimate knowledge about webinars. Speaking of which, if this is your first time on a webinar, we are excited to have you here. And please keep in mind that you can actually communicate with me at any time today simply by typing a note in the question box on your GoToWebinar dashboard. If you want to actually practice that right now, you can find the question box uh, on your GoToWebinar dashboard, and you can just type hi or yes and send that over. And that will uh, indicate to me that you're hearing my voice and that everything's working fine. So go ahead and do that now just to get a little bit of a practice out of that. Also, yeah, it looks like everything's coming in, so, so that's good. Also, as a reminder, during the remainder of this hour, you are encouraged and invited to ask as many questions as you want. Simply enter any question you have in that GoToWebinar dashboard, and if we have time at the end, we'll try to address as many questions as possible. Now, we have three speakers for this webinar, and I will introduce them just before they speak, but for now, let us just meet them. Our first speaker is Marlene Stahl. Marlene is um, on the line, and I know that she's there. So um, we're going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, and that is Alita Delport from South Africa. And Alita, are you there? I'm here, thank you. Okay, great. And our third speaker is Dr. Leslie Lyons, a genetics expert who is our keynote speaker. Dr. Lyons, just go ahead and say hello so that we can get a sound check of your voice. Hello, everyone, and hope uh, everyone's having a nice holiday and happy Thanksgiving. Okay, great. And uh, so what I'm going to do now is uh, make sure the recording is uh, working properly. I'm just going to take a moment to do that, and then we'll get ready to begin. Okay, so the recording is working fine, and we are ready to start. I want to... Uh, Welcome everyone who's just joining. Uh, some people just joined in the last minute or so. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and move on to our agenda. And during the next hour, Marlene will take about 10 minutes to do a Thanksgiving tribute to Jean Ramsdale and Jeannie Johnson, two people that played a, a tremendous role in the United States to preserve the original chinchilla by propagating color breeding. After that, Alita will take 10 minutes to tell us more about the late Stella Slabber, the lady that led the project to get the chinchilla long hair separated from the modern Persian in South Africa. And she will also tell a bit about the roles played by herself and Dr. Johan Lamprecht in the breed recognition process. Our keynote speaker is Dr. Leslie Lyons, who will talk for 20 minutes on the genetics of the chinchilla Persian. This will be followed by a 10-minute slot for questions and answers. So we now move on to the first point on the agenda, the USA history. Our first speaker is Marlene Stahl. Marlene from the San Francisco Bay Area here in California has been breeding and loving cats since 1964. It was this year when she saw her first cat at the age of five, and she has been hooked on them ever since. She had dreams as a young adult of becoming a wild cat biologist, and even though that exact dream never materialized, she did marry a wildlife biologist who has published a book on an endangered wild cat species. And together, she and her husband today breed traditional chinchilla and shaded silver Persians and Norwegian forest cats. They love breeding and nurturing baby cats and placing them into loving homes. Marlene works in her own small way to make a big difference in saving the chinchilla Persian and all the traditional long-nosed Persian cats. Her introduction to the pedigree cat world was shocking and tumultuous. In 1992, having purchased for the first time a long-awaited, perfectly beautiful traditional chinchilla 
who died five weeks later of FIP, she went on an emotional quest to find a replica of this beloved kitten. On her journey, she came to know Jean Ramsdell on her deathbed, and she spent many hours talking to this mentor and learning. This made a very big impact on the young newcomer to the world of pedigree cats. Moreover, her quest found her also in the path of Jeannie Johnson in Jeannie's quest to save the Silver Persians. Marlene has never forgotten the passion and dedication these two women shared to save the traditional chinchilla Persian, a creature of beauty. Marlene, over to you. Thank you very much, John. Um, hello to everybody. I'd like to wish you a, th a happy Thanksgiving weekend, um, which is the beginning of the holiday season here in the United States. And just a bit more I'd like to share um, about myself before moving on to uh, our past um, heroines in um, this breed. As a child, I was brought up to pray and believe in a higher power. I was taught to be kind, good, and honest. At the age of five, I saw my first cat in the street. And in my own childlike way, I asked God if he'd give me a cat. My prayer was this, please, dear God, if only you would give me a cat, I'll never ask for anything again. <laughs> a year later, um, which is a very long time for a child to wait, um, someone gave me a very, very, very sick. The poor thing had been abandoned and not really, it wasn't even really the most attractive cre creature. I was grateful and accepted this delicate little creature with as much love and nurturing as I could offer. My mother mercifully had the common sense to take the kitten to be put out of his misery as he was going to die soon anyway. And that he was pretty much beyond any hope. She explained to me that he was going to a better place. And she got me two healthy cats, which I had one for 18 years, a beautiful calico. Um, I've had many cats since, and this feeling never leaves me. It seems like every time I have a cat, I think it's the prettiest, most wonderful cat I ever saw in my life. Um, I think this is an important attitude to have for anyone. It's almost like a gift just to be able to love something so much. Um, what I feel that I've done of importance in my life regarding having cats, especially these beautiful pedigrees, is throughout the 1990s and the 2000s um, as, a, as a breeder, a small scale breeder of the traditional chinchilla and shaded silver Persian kittens, I tried to sell them at various prices, sometimes re quite reasonable prices, to people who I felt would really um, appreciate them and give them a good home. We couldn't afford much. I've taken care of health concerns. And I don't really practice a lot of discrimination as to potential owners. I, I feel like if somebody really wants a cat, they deserve to have one, as long as they're willing and able to give the cat a decent home. Um, I've also put a lot of importance on giving the kittens a lot of attention to socializing and love. I feel that in the early weeks, the more attention a, a pet cat can get from a human owner, it, this does really form for life part of the personality of a cat in addition to the genetics. Um, I've also taken my kittens to retirement and convalescent hospitals uh, to play with, um, with people who are, who are animal lovers. Uh, some people are and some people are not animal lovers, but I've found that patients in um, convalescent homes, elderly patients, really appreciate that. Uh, I've also taken them to churches to play with children. And so I'm, I'm glad I was able to sometimes make the world a better place with my cats. Um, OK, now going down memory lane. Uh, I recently had the honor of interviewing Larry Johnson. He is a well-established animal photographer from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He is the spouse of the late Jeannie Johnson, um, a very important breeder for the uh, Shaded Silver Persian, but more along the lines of being called the Sterling. Okay, Larry shared with me a brief history of his wife and Jeannie Johnson's endeavors to get the Sterling breed recognized in Tika. Um, so I'm going to go on to that. Uh, the brief history of the Sterling breed and its vision in the eyes of the late Jeannie Johnson. Um, I have here a little uh, internet uh, posting which I found, which I'll just briefly read some of it. You can read the rest on your own, and you'll be able to see the URL. The Sterling originated 
in the United Kingdom as a man-made breed known as the chinchilla long hair. Um, a cat show of the late 1800s had a chance meeting with an unknown male resulting in Chinny, the mother of the chinchillas. Um, going on to the next paragraph, the breed concept was created and developed, developed by Ginny Johnson, Ivy League Sterlings, through the efforts of our Save Our Silvers Foundation. This was founded by Mrs. Johnson in the 1990s. Cats were selectively color-bred in the States with imports from England, New Zealand, I understand also South Africa. Um, okay, so you can read the rest of that on your own. Now, getting back to Larry and my personal interview with Larry, Jeannie Johnson's um, late uh, Jeannie Johnson's husband, the late Jeannie Johnson's husband. During my phone interview with Larry, um, he stressed that Jeannie preferred to keep the silver cat a true colorbred cat. Jeannie studied the origins of this cat in England. She considered this the home of the silver. Jeannie did two trips to England and to go into the archives of the GCCF. Uh, these records date from the 1800s. She also went to the big cat shows of England. She believed that the genetics behind the silver are different from the British long hair breed. She believed that the silvers were never a were never a Persian cat. And again, she believed the Silvers were never were a Persian cat. Uh, Jeannie believed that the current problems began when cats were brought to the US. This breed was shown for 100 years in England as the long hair Silver. Jeannie's goal was to create a new breed, the Sterling. Jeannie's attitude was that instead of fighting Persian people, her attitude was, let's create a new breed that stands alone, only shooted slivers and chinchillas. That was her goal. She started with outcrosses from England, South Africa. The sterling was a cat unto itself. This breed proposal came in front of the board of Tika. Jeannie got all the paperwork done. It was a huge undertaking, a lot of work and dedication. In 1992, the family, Jeannie's family went through Hurricane Andrew, Jeannie's pregnancy, having to move to a new house and other personal obstacles. The, the family did everything in line. Okay, Jeannie did everything. She had everything in line, and she was working with about 15 catteries. Jeannie had all the proper registration guidelines in order for the new breed in Tika. In addition to her work with Tika, Jeannie worked with CFA. She went to see Jean Ramsdell before Mrs. Ramsdell passed away. She spent the day with her. She did many interviews with CFA people. She also wrote many articles for CFA Yearbook. She did many articles on health topics. She did writings in Cats magazine. She started the Save Our Silvers program. Jeannie always believed that initially these cats were not Persians. In addition, she believed the cats of other colors never produced silvers. She believed that the silver color does not naturally occur. Uh, Jeannie encountered opposition in her quest. The cats were not winning in the cat shows. Greater started outcrossing to get the modern type. Now, this is before she got her breed recognized. That is, going back a bit before, um, I would imagine she was showing them as Persians initially. So her cats were not winning. Breeders started outcrossing to get the modern type, this ultra-peaked face. Now, um, this movement of getting the modern ultra-peaked face Persian unfortunately lost a lot of the beautiful deep green eye color. There were, and then um, Larry mentioned to me that at the time there was an attitude among people who wanted to save the traditional cat. There were faults on the judges and breeders part as they wanted to play God. This was how, the way um, Larry worded it to me. They wanted to play God um, and breed something more extreme. They were not thinking of the health of the cat. And this was Jeannie's battle. Um, she, that's why she had her entitlement, save our silvers. Um, what was the cause of the extreme peak face? Going back to the English GCCF, that's the governing council of the cat fancy, uh, they, they had a red peaked face Persian, which had a genetic link to the extreme peaked face. This was the origin of the fault, which has caused so many health problems. This was the enemy which Jeannie was fighting. Jeannie kept everybody together in the cause of the Sterling breed. It was a tremendous amount of work. 
Then she gave birth shortly after she got into an auto accident. She suffered brain damage, was not able to keep up. She was in a lot of pain, especially back pain. She had to be medicated. Sadly, Jeannie finally died from the effects of this accident. After this, the leadership was lost. Her death ended the cause of the sterling. In essence, Jeannie's goal was to not call this cat a Persian in this way. It would be possible to not argue or debate, but just break away from the new extreme peak face type and go back to basics, the original type. Okay. Um, and I want to also note before I leave off on Jeannie, um, she also strongly advocated color breeding. Um, and I can see from studying her history that there is a great need to have very large groups of people on any endeavor um, and not leave the leadership up to one entire person. Sometimes it's just not humanly, humanly possible. Okay, I'd like to go on to Jean Ramsdale now, um, another heroine, an icon in this uh, cat breeding world. Uh, the following are some notes from Terry Green. She knew Jean Ramsdale well. In the 1970s, Terry began her relationship with Jean Ramsdale. Terry would visit um, Jeannie's beautiful home by the sea in Southern California in Long Beach. Terry remembers Jean Ramsdale's big bedroom where she kept 24 female chinchilla shoes slipper cats. Um, Jeannie, Jean Ramsdale would spend hours with Terry teaching her about the proper care of these cats in her beautiful home. This went on through the 1970s and the 90s. Um, we were able to save some of those lines um, from Terry Green, who eventually um, placed them with other breeders. Now, my own personal memories of Jean Ramsdale are closely connected with the death of my first chinchilla Persian kitten, which I first purchased in the 90s, a beautiful cat. Um, I was very disappointed at this time to see what was happening with the fat, flat-faced cats, and I got to know Jean Ramsdale, who I could see even and when she was ill at the end of her life, had so much determination, dedication um, to keep the old lines going and to save the breed um, as it was originally beautiful, natural, um, attractive, and healthy. To summarize um, Jean Ramsdale, she was probably the most important and influential breeder of chinchilla Persians in the 20th century America. She wrote an important book entitled Persian Cats and Other Long Hairs. She teamed with her husband, a well-established veterinarian, and served as a cat judge for many years in major cat organizations. Along with Jeannie Johnston, Jean Ramsdale opposed crossbreeding, shaded silver, shaded silver chinchilla Persians with other breeds. She, and again, she opposed um, the, cross, the crossbreeding with other Persians. Her contributions are still in living effect today. Okay, um, I'm going to move on now, leaving memory lane. We're going to look into the future. Um, our guest, our, our professional cat expert guest, is Dr. Leslie Lyons. And so, I'd like to give so, Marlene, we'll, um, I'm going to take it back over here. <laughs> okay. And we'll do that introduction in a little bit. We're going to bring Alita on next. So, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, not a problem. Okay. So, um, let's go ahead and move on to the second item on our agenda, which is going to be the South African history. And our speaker here will be Alita Delport. Now, Alita owns the Sherry Finesse Cattery in Cape Town, which is registered with both the South African Cat Council, SACC, and the Cat Association of South Africa, CASA. And CASA is affiliated with the World Cat Congress. The Sherry Finesse website is at www.sherry-finesse.se. .co.za. Career-wise, Alita is semi-retired. She does methodology consulting and also lectures in the IT industry on an ad hoc basis. 
Now, on request by many people, she is committed to convert the WCF breed proposal document that she wrote for the original long hair into a book of format. And for the past three years, she has actually been working sporadically on this book. The book itself spans the past 50 years, starting where Jean Ramsdale's book ended. Now, progress is slow, yet she keeps being bombarded by questions from people all over the world on a wide range of topics. And she's answering those emails, and that takes up a lot of time. And she now tries to answer questions on the go at a website that covers the intended chapters of the book. Now, once all the bits and pieces of the predefined book skeleton are completed, paper-based paper and e-book formats of the book will be available. The website where she's currently maintaining those questions is right here displayed on this page. I'll read it out to you, tlh.ad.co.za. There's no need to put www in front of that. And that website will remain free for all as Thanksgiving to the cat fancy. So, Alita, over to you. Dear fellow cat lovers, the South Africa history of the original long hairs started with Stella Slubber. Stella Slubber was an amazing person. This photo was taken at the last show where she judged at age 83. About six months later, she passed away at age 84. Next slide. Stella's love for chinchillas started when she saw a picture of a chinchilla in Jean Ramsdale's book. She wrote to the publishers to obtain the author's address. Over time, Stella imported seven deer hearts to South Africa. The first pair of deer hearts arrived in May 1971. Deer heart Alexander and deer heart Jennifer. Jennifer turned out to be a showstopper. She was the first long hair ever in South Africa to obtain grand champion status. And the second one for supreme status. An offspring of note was champion Cherie Alexis. The second pair imported from the deer heart Kateri were Daniel and Chantilly. Look at that smiling face green eyes and rough around Daniel's neck. They produced a daughter named Cherie Chansonette. Out of the mating between Sanchonette uh, and Alexis, Cherie dear Nikki was born. He made history by being the first long hair supreme champion in South Africa, beating his grandmother Jennifer in the race to stardom. Dear Nikki was also the first long hair to win the South African Cat of the Year award. After Stella's success, the breed expanded. Can we? Many people started breeding silver chinchillas, spreading the deer heart footprint in South Africa. Key catteries of the 18s included names like Brickhill, Denshin, Delkusha, Gardenia, Lunas, Lovebuck, and more. Lovebuck, owned by Janet Longman, bred the legendary distinguished merit Lovebuck King Arthur. Le Janet, like many of the above breeders, stuck to Stella's mentorship of silver color breeding. King Arthur was the last cat that she bred. More than a century after Silver Lambkin was born, one can still see the resemblance between Silver Lambkin and King Arthur. So, and then the sad part of the story. Global breeding towards embedding the brachycephalic mutation in Persian resulted in, resulted in the pig-faced Persian growing in popularity. If you snooze, you lose. Colored breeders who could not induce brachycephalism sadly became show losers. Even a cat like dear Nikki, cat of the year in 1980, did not meet the Persian standards anymore. 
less and less breeders persisted in not jumping the bandwagon of brachycephalic enhancement. It was a hard and lonely road for a handful of breeders that persisted. In parallel with Jean Ramsdale's urge to Jeannie Johnson, she also urged Stella to separate the breed standard in South Africa. Stella said yes. Dr. Johan Lambrecht assisted with setting up the standard and governance guidance. I assisted with documentation compilation. The breed was accepted in 1996 by SAC under the name Chinchilla Longhair. A cat needed five generations of pure silver before it could cross over. This later changed to four. Goldens were not included. But Stella is a success. Some the next slide, please. Retaliated. Here is an example. In 1999, there was a proposal to abolish the chinchilla long hair standard of points and the status of the breed. The, motivated, the motivation supplied included, this was never genetically a new breed or a breed that had developed through careful selection. This was simply a successful effort of breeders whose cats do not conform any more to any standard in the world to enable their cats to get the warts on show. How do you respond to such aggressiveness? Next. By going on your knees and plead for mercy? Yes, that too. But also by knowing and following the rules of the governing body. The Chinchilla Breeders Group appealed with valid evidence to the SAC Governing Council to scrap point 11 from the voting schedule. The appeal was accepted and the proposal was ruled out of order. In Thanksgiving, we must also say thanks to the fathers of the Internet. Thanks to the Internet, Jeannie Johnson and I could correspond. We exchanged experiences and became Internet friends. We were to exchange cats but unfortunately, personal strat strategies struck both, both our families, culminating with Jeannie's sudden death. The internet also connected Diane Amble and Talira Delport, resulting in a breed exchange program that benefited the gene pool on a global scale. On the picture you see Riefen is the next of El Dierhard, which was the first cat. Uh, that uh, in this exchange program. We must also give thanks to the commercial value of the original long hairs. In South Africa, they were at one stage called the pamper cats because they were used as a brand animal for the South African pamper cat food. When Nestle took over that cat brand, um, uh, sorry, Stella's cats featured in many other commercials. Okay. When, when I took over Stella's cats, I carried on with the, the, the TV commercials and film shooting. The uh, Nestle used the long hairs as their brand food for the Nestle Gourmet and the Nestle fancy feast and therefore they didn't, you know, no, 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 stay on that, that slide for now okay. please. Okay. It's a bit of a, bit of a confusion here. What I want to say on this slide is then, uh, at the, because of this uh, filming, at the point in time, Nestle told me that I need to have, a, to pr provide um, proof that the cats were not the ultra-modern Persians because apparently that was banned in the European Union to be used in TV commercials. And it was very easy for me then to just submit the pedigrees or the registration of the chinchilla long hairs that was registered with the SA Cat Council. Now we can go to the next slide. When I told Johan Lambrecht about this, he said, 
maybe that was an opportunity to go global with the breed. He suggested that I ask Nestle Purina Europe to sponsor a WCF breed recognition show in Cape Town. They agreed. I compiled the breed proposal documentation. Johan organized the show. He also delivered the breed proposal presentation at the WCF AGM. In, 20, in, 19, in 2010, the standard for silvers and goldens was accepted. Two, year later, two years later, the standard was extended to have the same color footprint as the Persian. Now the road ahead. I myself now is not young and healthy anymore. The road ahead for you as lovers of the original long hair will be as from certain stage that I cannot predict without me. The road ahead will be hard work. I want to conclude my thanksgiving with an inspirational quotation by Max Planck. A scientific truth does not triumph by convincing the, its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and the new generation grows up that is familiar with it. Jean Ramsdell saw the light in the early 50s. She had opponents. She told Jeannie Johnson and Stella, Stella Slobber about the light and they followed up when Jean Ramsdell could do no more. They had opponents. Stella told Johan Lambrecht and myself about the light we assisted and we assisted Stella when she could do no more. We had opponents. I give thanks to you, a new global generation that is becoming familiar with the light that Jeannie ja Ramsdell ignited. May you unite to get the original longings back on all show benches. May we save the meat, breathe. Back to you, John. Well, thank you very much for that inspiring presentation, Alita. And at this point, I want to now move on to the main point of the agenda, which is genetics. And our speaker here will be Dr. Leslie Lyons. Um, Marlene has been working with Dr. Lyons to, to bring her on board with this. And at this point, I'd like to turn it back over uh, briefly to Marlene to introduce Dr. Leslie Lyons. Thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, we're very excited to have Dr. Leslie Lyons here. She was trained in human genetics, specifically disease mapping. Her postdoctoral fellowship focused on developing genetic resources in the domestic cat. During her tenure at NCI, she worked closely with theriogenologists at the National Zoological Park to produce a feline interspecies back cross between domestic cats and the Asian leopard cats, the Bengal cat. In addition, she began curating cat DNA samples of likely heritable traits. In 1999, she was recruited by UC Davis to continue research in, comparative genetic, in the comparative genetics of cats. Due to the increased ability to ascertain traits and diagnose diseases in cats, her research is now primarily focused on heritable diseases and traits and the population dynamics of the domestic cat, including for forensic science applications. Specific diseases remain of high priority, including polycystic kidney disease, PKD, skin abnormalities, structural defects, and heritable blindness. Dr. Lyons has also supported the community by providing DNA studies for the first cloned domestic cat, wildcat, sand cat, and the GFP transgenetic cat. Her laboratory has identified over 30 mutations in 21 genes, including many diseases, several coat colors, several fur types, and um, cat AB slash B blood type. She has recently launched the 99 Lives Cat Genome Sequencing Initiative, an effort to have deep coverage on cats with inherited diseases and as an SNP resource for the community. And now I would like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Leslie Lyons. 
Okay, well, let's get rolling. Um, at first, I'd like to thank you for the invitation to speak with you today. Um, I see my job as a, a cat geneticist to, to provide the most scientific information you can have. I generally don't have a dog in anybody's fight, um, so I just really try to make sure that when people are making decisions and, and arguments about cats and breeds and breeding, that I supply them with the most accurate information so they can make the most sound judgments. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see that uh, our laboratory studies inbred cats, and uh, but not only just the breeds, but um, feral cats around the world as, as well. Um, we are focused on really trying to improve cat health, and by doing that, also understanding human health. Uh, next slide, please. So we can see that most of my funding is from a variety of different sources, but the biggest portion of our funding is from the NIH, and that's really to build genetic resources for scientists so that they can study cat genetics, um, mainly to help uh, human diseases that are similar to what we find in cats. Um, but also, the Wind Feline Foundation has always been a big supporter of um, our laboratory so that we can focus on um, particular aspects of cat breeds. Next slide, please. So um, I very much appreciate hearing the history of how the cat breeds develop. That's not my expertise or my forte, so I always uh, am willing to be stand corrected on anything that I might say that's inaccurate. Um, but I'll try to work through what I know about uh, the Persian breed in general. Um, I did speak with Jeannie Johnson early in my career about Sterlings, and Sterlings do happen to be one of my favorites because I'm a big James Bond fan, and to me it looks like a Sterling is, is one of the cats that Blofeld always has on his lap in the early James Bond movies. So um, if anybody knows whose cats those are, I would, I would love to hear more about uh, the James Bond cats. So. As we've studied cat genetics, uh, we had an opportunity to look at different breeds, and, and so we couldn't look at every possible breed from a genetic point of view. So we tried to pick breeds that we thought have been around for a very long time. And so knowing that on this slide some of the uh, cats that were part of the early cat fancy are presented, such as the Manx and the Russian Blue. And at the time, I, I don't think the long-haired was called the Persian, maybe the Angora, and that then developed later into the different lines of Persians. Um, but what we knew at the time is that colorations and some cats, such as the Manx with no tail, did were genetically defined distinct groups, such as the foreign body of the Siamese um, and the long-haired cat. So when we started our genetic studies, we kind of started with some of these early breeds and, um, and continued from there. So our next slide. So when we do our genetic studies, we type a bunch of genetic markers in different cats, and then we tell the computer to lump them all together. So, and then we go in and we put the labels onto the cats, and we see if genetically they all tend to lump together. So each one of these different colors represents a diff different genetic pool, and then we went and stuck the label on it of what that pool ended up representing. So you can see that um, a lot of the breed groups are mainly one color, so that means their genetics is uh, pretty well defined. You'll see in Persians and exotics are basically the same color. So telling you that from a genetic point of view, just having one genetic difference, long hair versus short hair, is not really enough to divine, define a breed from the genetic point of view. Uh, what we also discovered with these genetic studies is some cats' breeds do really come from where they say they do. And so in the next slide, you'll see that um, from this little tree that we have drawn, all the cats in red tend to be cat breeds that were um, developed from Western European random bred cats. So all the breeds are developed 
out of random bred cat populations. And so somebody decided, hey, this is cool or that's cool, and, uh, and then it develops into a breed. So um, we'll see that a lot of the, the ones in the bottom lower left are green, and those are your Siamese or what used to be called the foreign breeds. And they do really come from cats that are off the street of Southeast Asia. Um, you'll notice that there's some numbers on these different branches of the trees. The higher the number, the more accurate we think we are. And so generally you don't put numbers below 50%. Um, so you can see that the Persian and exotic and its uh, separation actually from the British shorthair is very strong significantly and we know those are very closely related genetic pools. Next slide please. Then more recently we have studied um, some other cat breeds because we have been studying the morphological mutations. So in the case of the Selkirk Rex, we are studying the gene for curly coat and for the Scottish fold, uh, the folded ears. So we know both of those mutations. Those are available as genetic tests and we're trying to get their stories published. Um, but what we do know that all these cats come from Western European populations of cats. Um, all the cats in the United States are Western European cats. They came over with the pilgrims and um, the uh, different settlers and migrants that came to the U.S. But um, we can now develop families, genetic families of cats. So again, here we see that Persian exotics lump very close together. And sometimes it's a little hard to see these different shades of blue. Um, but the British Shorthair, the Scottish Fold, the Selkirk Rex, the Persian, and the exotic Shorthair really kind of film, form a pretty coherent genetic structure, genetic cluster, saying that they kind of form a breed family. <clears throat> Next slide, please. What we also do know is um, for Persians, the current day uh, Persians that, uh, so when we've done this study, we went out and got samples from CFA and Tika Persian cats that were from mainly the United States. Um, so uh, unfortunately the, the sterlings aren't really represented in our genetic studies at this point. Um, but we do know a lot about long hair as well. And we can tell you that the long hair mutation likely did originate in short hair cats that were from Persia. So the name Persian in regards to it being a long haired cat actually does match and that is true. This is the most common long-haired mutation in all cats. There are some breeds such as Norwegian Forest Cat, Maine Coon, and Ragdoll that have a mutation that looks like help to develop their breed and is more prevalent, but all these breeds also have the mutation that's common to Persians as well. So the long hair that is found in Persians is the original long hair of all cats. Next slide, please. What we have to keep in mind um, genetically, I'm going to discuss a little bit about some health conditions next. And, um, and when I'm making decisions on how to tell, what, what to tell people to do with their health issues, this is one of the things I consider, is how big is the breed? Um, because what we don't want to do is put the cat breed through another genetic bottleneck. And so, of course, what we do know about Persians exotics and the Persian family is that it is amongst the biggest breed within the CFA uh, for the past many, many years. Uh, so it's always at the top of the list. That means it has a very good um, big gene pool. Next slide, please. And so then also we say, so we have the Persian related breeds, so that includes the British Shorthair, the Selkirk Rex, the Scottish Fold. They account for some 66% of the cats in the CFA. So that's going to mean that I'm going to make different breeding recommendations as far as outcrossing, how to manage health uh, situations in a Persian and its related breeds as compared to something I might say in the Burmese 
or the Korot, which has very few uh, numbers as far as its breed population size. Next slide, please. Overall, if we look at the genetics of, um, that we've been able to do uh, with various different breeds, we'll see that the Persian is kind of somewhat towards the middle. Yeah, there you go. And um, you'll see that the dark black line is fairly high. It's not the highest. Um, but notice it's not as low as um, the Singapore, and um, it's still higher than the Burmese as well. That second lighter line beside it is the inbreeding coefficient. So you want that line to be low as well. So the lower that line is, the less inbreeding there is. So you want high genetic diversity, but low inbreeding. And we can see that the Persian is not doing too badly in comparison to other breeds. Um, breeds that are doing very well are something like the Norwegian forest cat and the Siberian, which are very high genetically and have very little inbreeding. Ragdoll as well. That's because they're brand new breeds. They're getting cats really from uh, natural populations and they're keeping the breed healthy in that regard. We want to stay away from the far left, the Burmese, where I'm strongly recommending a very strong outcrossing program because their inbreeding is high and their genetic diversity is low. Um, we really need to try to move them to the higher end for diversity and, and lower their inbreeding coefficients. So breed management is much di more different for a Burmese than it would be for a Persian. A good example of how you can do things well is take a look at the Korot. The Korot has pretty high genetic diversity, very low inbreeding. It's not a very popular breed. So how do they keep this going? Uh, well, they bring in some cats from Thailand every once in a while. And they have had uh, known genetic uh, problems for quite a while. And plus, they have a couple colors they don't want. They don't want pointed cats. They don't want chocolate cats. But they use genetics to not breed carriers together, and they share cats around the world. So they've been able to keep their genetics very strong in a population that is very small. So they're one of my uh, favorite groups to work with. They're the ideal representation of how to properly manage your cats. So for Persians and their related breeds, what do we need to worry about? Next slide, please. Of course, there's polycystic kidney disease. Before the genetic test was launched in 2004, over 30% of cats around the world, Persian cats, had polycystic kidney disease. Now, many cats will have very mild disease, which you see on the left-hand side. Uh, so they have cysts in their kidneys, but they'll probably live a normal life and not die of renal failure. They'll probably die of something else. Where a lot of cats, as you see on the right, have very severe disease and will die of an early age. Um, so what we do want to do is move away from that fast progression disease, but eventually eliminate the disease what's, uh, completely. But even though you have a large population of Persians, you don't want to eliminate 30% of those Persians right away. So over the past 10 years, uh, I've worked with genetic testing labs, and I know that uh, the rate of positive PKD cats is dropping, and so that's making me very happy to see that go away. Um, so eventually, probably in another five to ten years, hopefully there won't be any PKD that we need to worry about. Next slide, please. Next slide is an ultrasound image. So even if you know your cat has PKD, you won't know how severe it is. So you should still always be working with your veterinarian uh, to help manage your cat populations. And if you have a cat with severe PKD, I would strongly recommend against breeding that cat as compared to a cat with mild PKD, and then hopefully selecting somebody to replace that cat right in the next generation. Next slide, please. I think some people don't realize that PKD can also affect uh, the liver as well. So you can see that this is a horrible looking uh, liver, and it's all full of cysts all throughout the liver as well. So the cats can die of liver failure also from polycystic kidney disease. Next slide, please. 
Something else I'd like to tell you about is uh, for the past 14 years, I've been also working on a uh, blindness that's in Persian cats. And um, it causes the cats to go blind very early, within 8 to 16 weeks of age. It is a recessive trait. Uh, we have published on this uh, trait, so veterinarians should know it's there. Um, next slide, please. Um, sometimes the kittens uh, don't focus very well, and you'll see that they look like they're a little what we would call wall-eyed. That's divergent um, strabismus, and so they're uh, not focusing properly. Um, next slide, please. Uh, uh, most any veterinarian can dilate the eyes and do what's called a fundus exam. And so what you're looking for is the vessels, the, the blood vessels in the back of the eye. And in affected cats, those blood vessels do not have a lot of blood in them. The vessels are there, but they're not pumped full of blood. And so you, they, you can't see them very well in the fundus exam. Very typical of a cat with progressive retinal atrophy. Um, it's an inherited blindness. If we look at the next slide, you can actually see what happens to their retina. The retina is the layer in the back of your eye that has the photoreceptors, and that's where light is absorbed and registered by the brain. And so we can see on the top panel, the affected cat, at three weeks of age, all its photoreceptors are there. Um, so that's perfect. That's what you want it to look like. But as compared to the control and the carrier, so carrier is still normal, is fine. You'll see that those layers, the one layer gets very, very thin and kind of almost goes away and is uh, degenerated. And so that's the cat going blind. These cats have perfectly normal looking eyes, um, but and get around very well. So it's hard to tell that uh, Persian cats are blind. This is something Persian cat breeders should be now genetically testing for. I think the DNA test is available at UC Davis. And uh, since this is probably a low percentage in a very big population of cats, I would recommend that we try to get rid of inherited blindness very quickly as, as compared to something like polycystic kidney disease where we want to slowly eliminate it. Okay, so that's diseases. Those are uh, diseases in Persians that you should be worried about when you're uh, developing outcrossing programs and, um, and maintaining your breeds. And uh, I don't know what the prevalence of these diseases are in the sterlings, but it'd be something we'd be very happy to work with you on uh, to make sure that your foundation lines and the lines that are moving forward are clear of these diseases. Now really we kind of wanted to talk about coat colors today. So let's move on to coat colors with oh, the next slide, please. Oh, this is just a summary of what diseases you need to worry about in different breed families. And so you'll see what the Persians and what their breed family is and uh, polycystic kidney disease and PRA. So on to the colors. This is the next slide. Our cats are just really wonderful to look at because um, you know all these different colors are really just from two different pigments, uh, eumelanin and pheomelanin. The orange gene on the X chromosome affects the hue of the black and the yellow. It's a, not an independent pigment on its own. So it affects both the different pigments that are made. And we'll see that when we talk about inhibitor, which is silver, it causes no production of the yellow pigment, which is the pheomelanin. If we look at the next slide, that's a pathway that um, uh, the body uses to make these pigments. And you can see that the pathway starts with tyrosine, and it can go two different directions to make uh, black pigment or make yellow pigment. And any disruption of these different enzymes, uh, the things that connect to the arrows, uh, will lead to variations in our colors. Next slide, please. We're coming along quite nicely with our colors. Um, a goody brown color, dilute, um, extension. Uh, many of these colors are now identified. Uh, we now know the genes that cause, we know the mutations that cause spotting and white. Our laboratory is very close to figuring out silver and ticked. And I know another laboratory has orange. So then, other than wide band, which we'll talk about in a little bit, a lot of your major coat colors 
in cats, we have genetic tests for. So they shouldn't be something that um, you're worried about losing the color because you can do a genetic test to get those colors back. Um, if we take a look at the next slide, you'll see that all the black and the yellow pigment gets laid down in the fur, uh, arranged like nice little soldiers. Uh, so those little black spots are different pigment packages in the different types of hair that is found in the cat's coat. Um, so each hair type might have more or less pigment in it because it's a thicker or thinner type of hair. So that will also affect the shade of the hair as well, on the shade of the color of the cat. In the next slide, we'll see that an example of coat colors is a goody, um, where a cat that is a brown tabby with one genetic mutation looks like an all-black cat. And if we take a look at the next slide, we'll see that really all that's happening is a, a brown tabby cat is just has banding patterns that's black, yellow, black, yellow, and, and we know Abyssinians even have another layer to that. But if you just take away the yellow in that banded hair, that gives you a solid black cat. Next slide, please. And when we actually talk about silver, um, that's going to actually make your smoke cat. So a black that's all cat black, uh, when it actually also has the silver mutation, will be what uh, everyone knows as smokes. Something I'd like to point out is with the next slide, with the uh, mutation for dilute, all these cats have exactly the same mutation. However, you now realize that they have different tones of blue. So that does mean we don't know all the little modifiers of genes that, uh, that affect the coat colors of cats. This is only black pigment in these blue cats, because in the next slide you'll see that the only difference is, is how the pigments are arranged in the hair. So these aren't exactly the same type of hair, but you can see in an all black cat, the pigments are very organized, where in a blue cat, the pigment packages are all kind of disrupted. Some of them are clumped, some are very small. This just causes an optical illusion to change that black looking cat to look gray or blue. So you're only making still two pigments, black and yellow, and for a blue dilute cat, it's just a reflection from the hair coat that causes it to look blue or gray. So when we get to talking about silvers, our next slide please, uh, really again all that's happening is that we're missing our yellow pigment. So what should look like a brown tick tabby or brown spotted tabby uh, next slide, please, is just really a cat that is missing that yellow pigment and everything else is the same and it, it should be a regular brown spotted or brown classic tabby cat. Um, so when silver, uh, next slide, please, we think this is a dominant mutation. It did uh, probably occur in the random bred population prior to breed development. So this comes into play that um, if early in the history of Persian cats, if someone hadn't selected for cats that had a silver coloration in the beginning, then yes, maybe that foundation population of Persian cats never had silver. But that doesn't mean they couldn't have. It, it, they just didn't select for those at the time. And so then when as silvers were established, those did prefer to have a uh, silver coloration. Now, there may be more than one gene that influences silver. So there could be another gene that causes recessive silver. We're not quite sure yet, but certainly the one that we tend to majorly talk about is a dominant mutation. And probably two copies of the mutation uh, lead to less barring um, in many of our cat breeds. So next slide, please. Along with silver, um, I think the biggest thing for the sterlings is more so the gene called wideband. And we're not really clear of how wideband is inherited. Again, maybe it was a, a gene that occurred before we domesticated cats, a mutation occurred before domestication. So that means it was in random bred feral populations 
and then just whatever cats got selected to develop our breeds, that's when um, you actually have these very cool colorations in, in the different breeds. You know, I hear this all the time that, you know, some breeds don't want chocolates and some breeds don't want cinnamons because they weren't in the original breed population. Well, they probably were in the original feral cat population. It's just that the cats that you selected for right in the beginning, uh, they might have been rare mutations and you just didn't identify those uh, when the cat breed was actually developed. Um, so there's a difference between saying it doesn't belong in the population because it's not in the feral population. That might not be necessarily true. It it just might be what you selected from your feral from your cats right at the very beginning. So wide band I think is the more important uh, gene that we know the least about for sterlings, and that's moving the length of that tip of, of black at the tip of the hair and actually cutting down the number of bandings that you actually have in the hair. So with a chinchilla, you're going to all these, the cats are going to be silver, but also more importantly they have this wide band mutation. And um, to really understand that we still need to do a lot more work on what that is. Now conversely, the next slide, if you have wide band, without uh, having silver, that's where goldens would come in. And so goldens are not really different from chinchillas from the point of wideband. They're different because they don't have silver. So um, really what distinguishes the chinchilla is wideband, not uh, the silver mutation. So with the next um, slide, we see that just to summarize, the effects of inhibitor, it's probably a dominant trait. Uh, you probably have less barring or tarnishing when you have two copies of it, so that's why people want to genetically test for it. It does interact with the goody, and that's when you see your smoke cats. Um, we don't know what this gene is. Uh, there's no example for it in other species, and it does affect, um, it is affected by your banding as well. So that's um, kind of the summary of silvers. And then I think the last argument for, for sterlings is the next slide is to discuss um, craniofacial morphologies. Um, as we've been coming along and getting better and better as, as far as eliminating diseases and being able or have genetic tests so that breeders can eliminate diseases and have genetics for all the mutations of coat colors, I put it back on breeders that it's really your job to consider the things that affect morphology. There will be probably major genes that affect how a skull is uh, formed. So here we see an oriental on the bottom and a peaked face Persian um, on the top. I want you to know that this has caused major controversy in the veterinary world. Um, the next three slides are just examples of um, what are in the veterinary world as far as having cats with faces that are basically too short. So I'm not a big proponent of the peak face Persian because it is causing abnormalities in the bite of the cat so they can't uh, eat as well. That will probably lead to other dentition problems. Uh, they can't breathe as well. They don't have drainage from their eyes as, as it normally should be. And um, so these are health problems that you, the breeders, really by adjusting your standards or the interpretation of the standards, um, you can really help fix yourself. Um, the slide that just popped up is really, it, it started this whole controversy. So that one paper led to all these commentaries, and you can see that some of the commentaries are just not so pleasant about what brachycephaly does to the Persian cat. And I do want to remind you of there's a lot of work of this in dogs, and that's my last slide here, that um, dog breeds particularly have a problem when they're brach brachycephalic um, because they can't get enough heat exchange through their nose and when they're panting. And so uh, a lot of brachycephalic dogs will have hypothermia, so they get too hot and um, it can't be adjusted and they are a risk for surgeries and then there is concern 
of uh, what is the survivability of uh, kittens when they are these brachiocephal, they have these very large heads. Can they be born naturally and how well do they, do they survive? So um, the dog fancy gets a lot of heat because of these brachiocephalic breeds and I hope that that's not our future for, for many of the cat breeds, especially because a lot of people use Persians to quickly modify their breed instead of slowly using selection to make a face the more you want to make it. That's why there's a big breed, big breed family for the Persian cats. So um, I hope some of those uh, uh, comments and slides will be able to help you with your, some of your breeding decisions and I'm very happy to field any questions uh, if we have time. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Leslie Lyons. And uh, at this time, we will uh, entertain questions as they arise. Uh, let me get back to our PowerPoint here. Um, all right. So uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of our webinar, you have the GoToWebinar dashboard. You can enter questions in the question box on that dashboard. Uh, this is a great time to do that. Our first question has already appeared. And Alita, are you still on the line? I'm on the line, yes. Okay. So the first question is, can you describe in a little bit more detail what the primary objective of your book will be and how and how and why it's going to be important to breeders around the world. I good. The book eventually was intended just to be a. Oops, can you hear me? Oh yes. Sorry, I, I, let me let me start again. I have the microphone pointed upwards. Um, the book initially was intended just to transform sort of what I had in the the breed recognition document for the WCF. That was, uh, that would have been a, a quick and fast book, but when I started to look more for citations to, to prove things uh, historically or scientifically correct, I ended up in all sorts of the, uh, avenues. At the moment, I have the, split the book into three uh, parts, let's call it parts. The first one will just focus on the the original long hair and that would go through all the histories of the problems we have in the names, where it comes from and so forth. So it will be his history and the genetics. The next part will focus on related breeds and that includes the different type of long hairs because there's a lot of confusion. Currently we have the original long hair, we've got the German long hair, we've got the English long hair. Uh, the Sterling breed doesn't exist anymore, although the name was used. The name at the moment that's used mostly is original long hair, referring to silver and golden, but all, also including all other colors. Uh, then also in the related breeds, there would be the, the Bermilla specifically, and also the, the original way back, the, the red peaked face versions and all the outcrossing and stuff. And then the third book, or the third part, third part will deal about all the questions I get on how to deal with the health of the Persians or the, specifically then the long hairs. They don't have that much problems, but uh, as compared to the, the, um, the short nose or the peak nose Persians, but yeah, that will look more into taking care of, of them. There's so many books on that issue, those topics already. But yeah, the first, to summarize in three parts, the first one will be the original long hair, the second the related breeds, and thirdly on caring uh, for the, the, the original long hair. Excellent. That was great. Um, I'd say we have another question come in, and this is for Dr. Leslie Lyons. Um, this is regarding the uh, feline retinal degeneration that you talked about. Um, can you provide a little bit more details on um, the uh, process for approaching UC Davis to uh, 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 test uh, some of your cats uh, for that condition? Uh, yes, certainly. It's, it's already available as a commercial genetic test. Uh, so we uh, allowed UC Davis to launch it early. Um, 
And so you can actually go to the UC Davis website and I think, um, you know, click on the boxes and select the Persian uh, PRA mutation for genetic testing. And we have, we, when we do our projects, we tend to work with um, Bristol as well. And so Langford Veterinary Services have also genetically tested a bunch of European cats and they too have found um, the, the mutation within the Persian cat breeds that uh, are sending their cats uh, to Bristol as well. Um, so we know it's there and uh, probably a lot of people do not recognize that they might have some blind cats. Absolutely. Um, yeah, this is uh, the point that, that you made. Um, I'm going now through some of the other questions that came in. Um, let's see, and these will be in no specific random order, um, so I'll let anyone who feels qualified to answer these to answer them. What, what especially can we learn of this webinar for the Bermilla cats? So that's, I'm just reading that verbatim there. Um, I guess this particular person had an interest in the Bermilla cats, and is there anything that she could take away from this, uh, or any comments that you have on that cat that might be of interest to her? Yeah, the Bermillas are, to my knowledge, crosses of Burmese with chinchilla Persians. So those are breeds of very diverse genetic backgrounds, so that's that's good for their breed. They'll have very different genetics and a lot of good, uh, a strong gene pool if they can maintain that as they move forward. But that also means they need to worry about all the genetic problems that are in Persians as well as Burmese. And, and Burmese are worse off than Persians are. They have a lot of factors you need to consider and many that we don't understand yet, such as feline oral facial pain and diabetes. Um, we, and uh, a skin disease, so, and these are all in Australian Burmese as well. So um, uh, they do need to carefully modify or moderate and watch the, the health of their breed as they move forward. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is also for you, Dr. Lyons. Um, in summary, could you comment on whether all chinchilla or shaded cats are wide banned? Um, I, I would think most of them are. Um, I, I, I wonder why that question is asked is more the question for me, um, because why would you think they're not? So I think uh, they do probably have um, some type of genetic modifier that is affecting the the banding pattern in their hair, and um, so I, I'm more curious as to why you, why that question's being asked. I'm thinking there's something I don't understand or 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 haven't seen. Okay, great. Um, and if we have a reply on that, I'll let you know. Um, let me see if I can get this next question to appear a little bit. Um, let's see, could the traditional, and I'm just reading this, give me just a second while I try to bring, bring it up here. Uh, okay, okay. Could the uh, traditional silvers be valuable in moderating the Persian population to dilute the brachycephalic presentation in the general Persian population that is under attack, particularly in Europe, as unhealthy and unacceptable. Did that make sense? Um, yes, it, in my mind they could, but that, that really comes down to people cooperating with one another. So um, from the genetic point of view, certainly. Okay, so we got that one answered. Let me move on to the next one. I have one sort of a very, um, yeah, I don't know how to explain this, but I, we started a Bermilla breeding program from scratch in South Africa. The reason for that is we don't use the Persian chinchilla. We use the original long hair or then the, 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 um, the old-styled 
a chinchilla, that is what we have in South Africa as a breed in its own right. So we started this experimental program. And now to our shock, we discovered that the Burmese that we were using that came from Australia uh, are actually have, having hypokalemia. And we now have to go back and uh, luckily we have a small footprint. But it is quite a, it will be quite an effort to go and test all the breeding cats. I don't know if uh, I would appreciate if Dr. Lyons can just comment on hypokalemia and and how do we? I, I suppose I know exactly how fast we can get rid of it. But yeah, can you tell us a little bit more on hypokalemia? Yes, uh, hypokalemia is very interesting from the point of view that it's it's not found in the United States at all, and uh, so it's primarily uh, UK, European, and Australian cats, and, and I think that's probably because many people did not want to use the contemporary Burmese from the U.S. Um, because they didn't want the head defect, but in the end you got hypokalemia, diabetes, and line oral facial pain uh, because there is still too much in being a pain. So um, it's relatively easy to do the testing. It's just buckle swabs and send them to Bristol or send them to UC Davis. There's, there's many laboratories that do the hypokalemia testing. It's just now what do you do that with your limited gene pool that's in South Africa, um, how do you control that? Well, it is a small gene pool, so we don't want to eliminate any cats if we don't have to. So what we like to do is just breed, don't breed a carrier, brother. don't breed carriers, because if you breed carriers, you will lose 25% of your cats will, will have hypokalemia. Um, so unfortunately, you're going to have to find some bloodlines that um, are not carriers and try to get those into South Africa. That is a shame that they got there. I tend to wonder um, if they kind of got dumped on South Africa, and uh, I, I hope not to think that. But uh, I would think someone, hypokalemia is not a mystery. People have known which cats had it, which was done. Now we just have a genetic test. So um, that's unfortunate. That, you have them there. Okay, I couldn't follow quite to the end because the line was again not not well. But I think I got the 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 gist of the story. Yes, I, I don't know. We we definitely, if, as responsible breeders, will not breed on with with carriers. We at least um, that I can can say. Okay. Um, can you hear me, John? Yes. Okay, I um, yeah, I know this is very controversial because um, people really want to color breed our silvers, our sterlings to maintain that really delicate color. We have a really beautiful color with green or blue green eyes, black eyeliner, and a whitish type of a cat. Um, and we have a large gene pool of silver chinchilla Persians with these extreme peaked faces. And they still have some beautiful colors, but we've got to do something about getting them healthy. And um, I'm not talking about doing this wide scale. I'm talking about doing this more on an experimental basis, um, just searching and searching for appropriate outcrossing. I came across Siberians, which out of all the forest cats, they have a more rounded type of a look than other like Norwegians in comparison with the Persian type of a round look. But they are very healthy. They're natural cats. And I have noticed that um, some of them, and I think I understand it's very rare, but some of them come in these chinchilla-like colors. They have green eyes, black eyeliner, and silver or chinchilla-like white fur. And they have the red brick nose with the black lining. Um, so. And because they're very immune healthy cats, they was, you know, they were natural cats living for hundreds of years, almost like feral cats, so very hardy. And I was wondering about having a very small controlled outcrossing program if there's anybody in the Siberian world who's interested in introducing the silver color. Um, 
and then, you know, just a source of outcrossing for health reasons, or do you think that would be a good outcrossing, or would it just completely mess up the delicate color that we're trying to keep, which is so rare with this with the silvers? Again, the white whitish cat with green eye and black eyeliner. Um, do you think that might be considered as a source of outcrossing um, in an experimental basis? Do you have any opinion about that? Well, I, I think those cats are already outcrossed. My guess is that coloration is not random red street cat from Russia. My guess is that coloration has already been brought in by crossing with another breed of cat, and I would bet it's already been Persians. So I bet they got the chinchilla type Siberians by already breeding with Persians. That's going to be my gut guess. Um, you do need to worry about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in Siberians. Um, so they do have some health concerns, but those, that's also a health concern in Persians as well. And, um, but otherwise, I think, uh, and then you would also want to, to be careful with um, the hair mutation as well, because uh, Siberians have the mutations that are from Norwegian forest cats, and we don't, we don't quite understand yet how these mutations affect the hair coat. No one's done that part of the study. Um, still, the Persian hair coat has other modifiers that makes it very unique as compared to other cat breeds. So not only with the color, you might uh, need to worry about the hair coat as well. But at some point, uh, you probably do need to do some outcrossing. And as you say, uh, a little experiment on the side, maybe in a generation or two, produce the cat that you really like and then that, bring that into the breeding program, that's uh, another way to go. Okay, our next question is, can someone comment on the difference between a cotton versus a silky? Maybe I should answer, try to answer that one. That's not a chicken, right? <laughs> <laughs> It's the it's the coat type and the the other coat. Do you know, uh, Dr. Lyons? Maybe do you know anything about it? So you you're much more uh, knowledgeable than I am. Uh, no, I, I don't. Can, I, I, I I've never heard the term. I've never heard the terms except for a silky chicken. But no. I, I think I can answer that. I I think I can because I we breed Persians and we also breed Norwegian forest cats and some of these long-haired cats that are not Persians. Um, they tend, it's a, they have a long fur, but it tends to just be more of a silky feel. They also don't mat up as much. Um, it's just a different texture, whereas the Persian has a more cotton-like, um, and, it, and it also it tends to mat. One thing that's nice about Norwegian forest cats, they have very long, massive coats, and they really, you don't really need to groom them or comb them. They very rarely get any knots. Um, and, but it is, it's a texture, and you see the cotton-like texture more in Persians. It also tends to vary among Persians. I have actually seen Persians that have more of a silky texture, and they don't seem to mat as much. And I have seen Persians with a very cottony-like texture fur, and those um, are, they're beautiful, fluffy coats, but they do tend to mat, and they're really high maintenance. I, but I can't explain it genetically. But I have seen it. Um, that's the best I can answer that question. Okay, uh, for Dr. Lizzie Lyons. What, what I can add? Oh, to okay, you, you go ahead, uh, Alita. Now, what I can add to that is from the history. Apparently, the the, the Persians came from Persia, obviously, and then from um, what's the, the the Angoras came from Turkey, and the Turkey cats had more thicker hair, more silky type of hair, while the Persian cats had more cotton hair. And as over time as they bred out, you still get uh, fall backs to either that or that. But remember the Persian has got two types of hair the coat. And the undercoat tend to be the more cottony one, while whilst the, the harsher, the longer hair are a little bit more lengthened to the, the silky type. Okay, yes, yeah. and, and the Angoras and the Persians, 
the Turkish Angoras and the Persians, have the same old, ancient, long hair mutation. So I think that's more to, even more to show you that during the development of the Persian breed, other modifiers that affect their coat um, have been selected for to give them a lot of them that, that cottony type, uh, where Norwegian forest cats even have a totally different long hair mutation. So um, these will be other things that will get solved later down the road, um, but there's certainly some genetics to it. Okay, our next question is for you, Dr. Lyons, and I have it up on the screen. Um, some Bermilla breeders in the U.S. are testing for PKD, HK, GM2, and cranial defect. Are we missing anything else we should be testing for? And you can probably read the rest of it right there on, on your screen there. Right. So Bermillas need to worry about everything in a Persian. So that's going to be polycystic kidney disease and uh, this, now this PRA, so they haven't been testing for the PRA, but that, that will come along. Uh, then on the other side, they've bred with Burmese, which are cats from Southeast Asia, and so you need to worry about all the Southeast Asia issues. And so that is hypokalemia. Uh, VM2 is, is more found in Korox. And so maybe are they thinking GM2 because they're bringing in Thai cats? Um, cranial de facial defect, if they're using American Burmese, absolutely. Um, other Southeast Asian cats also have pyruvate kinase deficiency, which is found in Singapore's and some um, Siamese as well. Siamese also have their own inherited blindness. Uh, it was found in the Abyssinian, but we know the mutation is in Siamese as well, the CEP290 mutation. So um, it all depends on really what outcrosses are going on. So you need to pay attention to the outcross. And then there's things that are not solved yet. So HCM in Persians, diabetes in the Burmese, oral facial pain in the Burmese. Um, so they'll continue They'll have to watch modif They'll have to watch a lot of different things in the Bermilla. Okay, great. Uh, I had another comment come in. Uh, this was from one of our uh, viewers. Uh, Jean Ramsdale was known to counsel that the most important breeding principle is to be ethical, and the Burmese issue is an example of that. So that was just a comment that came in to us. And I think we're getting near the end of our questions. Let me see if we have anything else here. Um, I think that's it. We have gone through all of the questions that came in. So um, Alita and Dr. Leslie Lyons, I want to thank both of you for being here. Um, obviously, in about a month, we're going to be in a new year. Um, and I'd like to end this with maybe taking a minute for each of you to just kind of talk about, in terms of the road ahead, what can we do as a group? All the people who are on this webinar, or who at least registered for it, if they didn't attend today, are very interested in what we've been doing. And as we look to the new year, um, what are some final comments that you'd like to share with us in terms of what the group can accomplish in 2015? Uh, we'll start with you, Dr. Lyons, and finish up with Alita Delport. Oh, I, I think mainly um, you want to, to know what's already in Persian cats and um, make sure that as you move your breed forward that you're watching for PKD and for blindness and, and trying to keep a, as big of a diverse gene pool as possible. And um, maybe as part of your standard have an outcrossing program already written into it. I think the GCCF is trying to get an outcrossing program for every possible cat breed. Okay, I, will, I want to be brief, and I think the very first uh, objective should be to go more scientific, to have more scientific knowledge about the genetics so that we can go the right way uh, in terms of various things like health, health and outcrossings. And then secondly, this group thinks the, the main objective will be to globalize the original long hair so that it gets recognized in all the different cat fancies 
that are members of the WCC. Thank you. Um, I want to thank everyone for being on the webinar and um, for staying with us all the way through the end. We actually had everyone here, um, so this was uh, a, a very successful webinar. No one dropped off, and uh, we really appreciate you sticking with us. Um, Dr. Lyons, I want to thank you for being here, and Alita, I want to thank you and Marlene as well for all of the planning that you did. Mm -hmm.